please rise. There's a lot of Christ in there. Please rise. There's a lot of Christ in there. Anybody else got any announcements? I put an announcer time here for the women's Bible study group. The pastor before he left this week posted on Facebook that women's Bible study group is going to be Jones. 
Okay. Who's that? Matt Ward. That's okay. <clears throat> Any others? Carol and Jimmy Clint are still on their trip. They're having lots of today. Okay. okay. I'm Carol and Jimmy Clint. Okay. <clears throat> Any other? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer with these. Pray with me silently, if you would, please. If you feel so led to join in, then that would be fine too. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, creator of all heaven and earth, giver of life, the sustainer of life, you are life. We pause to thank you for giving us that breath of life that we might see a new day. And we rejoice in it, for we know it's going to be a good day because it's the day you have made. Because of your love, your mercy, and your grace, you've allowed us to <coughs> gather together at this place. As we gather this morning, may we Step aside from the world around us. May we listen closely to your word as it's proclaimed, as the songs are sung, as the Holy Spirit moves within us. May we be touched. May we be strengthened. May we be joined closer together to each other, but most of all, that we might be joined closer to you. Lord, we all come this morning with things in our hearts and in our lives that concern us greatly. For those that we have mentioned this morning, those that have lost loved ones, grant them that peace and comfort that only you can. For those that need a healing hand, Lord, administer to them. May they feel that touch today. For our pastor and his wife as they're traveling, Lord, we pray for their safety and pray that it'll be a, a meaningful experience for them today and each day that they're on their trip. We do pray for our minister here today, Brother Chris, as he comes to bring us a message. Lord, we just pray that you fill him with your spirit. May he be strengthened, may he be encouraged to speak boldly the truth of your word. Be with us in this hour. May all that we do, all that we are, bring honor and glory to you. May everything that is, transpires, may it exalt our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. <coughs> if the ushers would come forward, let us portion of our time and all things. Obtain wealth, the Lord, we realize that 
there's a portion that belongs to you. May that be returned today with a cheerful heart. Bless now the gift and the giver. Amen.
Take this off. Maybe. There. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Um, well, like you said, my name is Chris Holbrook. I'm one of the pastors just down the street at Rescue House Church, and um, I, I get the honor to serve as the discipleship pastor there. And uh, I'm really glad to be with you here today. Uh, I, I just don't take this for granted one bit that. Um, Pastor Wes called me and asked if I would be a part of this, and I'm excited for all that he's getting ready to do. Um, I was telling somebody earlier, he's going to come back fired up um, once he visits the Holy Land, so I'm excited to see what he does for that. Can everybody hear me okay? We're good? Awesome in the back? Awesome. Um, well, my role as a discipleship pastor allows me to uh, like really get to teach and preach sometimes, and, um, but it really allows me to talk to a lot of people. And I love getting to meet with people, hearing their stories. And as I meet with people, a lot of times um, what, they'll, what they'll say is, those are very unique glasses. Like, that's what everybody said when you walked in, right? You saw these glasses and you're like, that's a little bit different. Um, I love my glasses because they are different. Like, I don't see many people with these style of glasses. Um, and another thing that I love about them is that they're very comfortable. They fit like right on my face just well. I about a year ago tried to get a brand new pair of glasses that were black and they just like rubbed my nose the wrong way. Has anybody ever experienced that? And it's like, man, I can't wear those. So these are super comfortable. Um, I like the look of them. I know that they're a little bit weird. They're a little bit unique and that's okay. Um, but what I really love about them is the price. Anybody want to guess how much I spent for my glasses? Free. They weren't, they weren't free. No, they're not just readers. No, they're prescription. I spent $16 on this pair of glasses. Wow. You, can, you can keep your $800 pair of glasses all day long. I'm going to stick with my $16. And I got them from this website called zennyoptical.com. Um, I'll be handing out flyers after uh, <laughs> church today for them. Um, no kidding, they really should put me on payroll because I tell everybody about Zenni Optical because they're great. You, can, you don't even have to use your, your insurance to buy these glasses, um, but you can still get your prescription, um, bifocals, all that stuff. And you can actually see them and like try them on, so to speak, before you even order them. And then if you break them, it's only $16. Like I, that, I love that. So I tell people about Zenni Optical all the time. Um, but what I know is that when we get excited about something, when we love something, we like to share it with other people. Who in here, you, you just love eating some good food? Like, just raise your hand up. We're in church, I know, but it's okay. You can raise your hand. Man, I love going to a good restaurant. And I had a buddy of mine, he was telling me, you got to go down to this restaurant in Salisbury, a barbecue place called The Smoke Pit. Anybody been down to the smoke pit? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Then you know what I'm about to talk about. And he was like, dude, you got to go. You have to go and try this out. And he, he's about for a month, he was like, you have to go down there and try this out. And he gave up finally. And he was like, fine, I'm coming to pick you up. I'm taking you down there. Like, you're going to the smoke pit with me. And you got to try this out. And when I say it was everything that he hyped it up to be, like, I, that's what I mean. He, like, he was telling the truth. If you haven't ever been to the smoke pit, 
you got to go down to the smoke pit. Get the Alabama white sauce. I'm telling you, it will be a game changer for you. And we live like so close to Lexington, barbecue capital, right? It's got to be some really good stuff, but it is. And I love telling people about the smoke pit. What I've realized in life is that when we get excited about something, we got to share it with other people as well, right? We like to share what we love with other people so that they can gain the same enjoyment that we get from it as well. And one of my favorite things in the entire world to share with people is God's Word. I love that the fact that I get to share with you God's Word today. And not only God's Word, but I'm actually going to share a story that Jesus shared with His disciples. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14. That's where we're going to be spending the day. Luke 14. And I like to give a little bit of context of what's going on so that everybody knows, like, um, kind of the behind the scenes, the build up to the story. So Jesus, he's having dinner, he's having the Sabbath dinner with one of the rulers of the Pharisees at his house. And this guy comes in and this guy has a disease called dropsy, which is like fluid build up in his legs, making it very painful for him to walk, for him to lay down. And Jesus, in the middle of this dinner, heals this guy of his disease. And all the Pharisees are like, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. What is he doing healing this guy? But nobody says anything to him. Jesus, he, he realizes that something's going on, that they're, they're concerned. So he begins teaching them three different things. He first teaches them how um, it's appropriate to heal on the Sabbath. It's okay to heal somebody of their infirmity, of their disease on the Sabbath. The second thing that he teaches them is, hey, when they throw a dinner party, you shouldn't choose the best seat. You shouldn't choose the place of honor. You should actually choose the less than seat so that when you come into the dinner party, they actually bring you up and they can honor you. Don't honor yourself. You should use humility. The third thing that he teaches on is who to invite to our dinner parties. It's just like today. Oftentimes, we'll invite the people that we know, the people that we're closest to, the people that we love to our dinner parties. But Jesus says, no, you need to, you need to invite the poor, the crippled, and the blind, and the lame to your dinner parties. And this made the Pharisees feel very uncomfortable. In fact, it made one Pharisee feel so uncomfortable that he just blurts out something in the middle of the dinner party. And because Jesus realizes that they don't quite understand what's going on, he goes into the story called the Great Banquet. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. In verse 15 of chapter 14, it says, When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Have you ever been in a moment where you just felt like uncomfortable in a conversation? Maybe it was like around Thanksgiving dinner and somebody started bringing up politics or somebody bring, brings up something in the news and you, you don't know what to do. You just kind of panic. Like have you ever had one of those moments and you just like change the top? Well, it's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Like I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. Because you just feel so uncomfortable. That's exactly what this guy is doing. He's trying to change the topic. But Jesus is like, okay, well, I'll meet you where you're at. And I'll talk about this topic. And he just makes it even more uncomfortable when he shares this. It says, but he, Jesus, said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. So to give you some context of what's going on Back in that time, whenever they would throw a big feast, the servants would go out and they would invite all of the guests to the dinner party. And once they RSVP'd that they would be there, they could then prepare the food. You didn't want to prepare too much food back then because then it would go to waste and they didn't have the resources to over-prepare. So they had to prepare exactly for the guests that would be in attendance. If it was like one, two, three guests, maybe they might have a couple of chickens. If it was like five to ten guests, they might have the fattened calf. But if it was like 20 to 40 guests, they would have the whole cow and they would prepare the food. But once you locked in your RSVP, it was, it was against traditional norms to not go to the dinner party. 
Once you said, yes, I will be there, they were preparing food specifically for you. So, he carries on and he says, And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. It's all prepared. The food is ready. The table is set. Now it's time for the party. He continues on, he says, But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have brought a field, or I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to the, examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. You see, we all have very busy lives, right? Like we all have things that we, uh, obligations that we have. Maybe it's a birthday party that we've been invited to. Maybe it's a dinner party. And it's okay to tell people no sometimes, but what we have to realize is that these guys had already RSVP'd. They said that they were coming. The food was prepared. The table was set for them. So we got to look at these excuses. What excuses did they use? The first two are very laughable excuses. When you think about it, who buys a field or oxen without first seeing the product, right? Like, when's the last time that you bought a car and you didn't even know the color of the car when you bought it? You don't do that, right? When's the last time that you bought a house without even seeing pictures of the house? You don't do that. Now, the third guy, he just recently got married, might have a good excuse why he can't make it to the dinner party. But really, these guys, they were putting everyday life in front of coming to God in his kingdom. You see, this whole message is about the kingdom of God. Jesus came to say the kingdom is here. And he's saying that people are missing out on the kingdom. So, these excuses. The problem is that, God, that the master had already prepared the feast. The food was ready. And he needed people to eat the feast. So he comes up with a plan. In verse 21 he says, So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. All of those people that Jesus said that they should have been inviting to the dinner party already. He's saying you need to go out and invite those people. Not just the people that like you're already friends with, but the least of these. The broken people. He's saying you need to invite the, the lady next door that won't ever come to church because she was burned when she went through a divorce. And the church shunned her. You need to invite the addict that wants to be clean, but they just don't know what they should do to be clean. You need to invite the girl that got pregnant when she was 16 in high school and now she has children by multiple fathers. You need to invite the, the lost and the broken into the dinner party. Go out and seek them. And he says, go into the streets, into the lanes. And what he's saying is those places where you already are. It's in your neighborhoods. It's at your job. It's in your community, your circle of influence. Go out and invite those people. And the servants, they go and they do just that. And they come back and, says the, and the servant says, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste my banquet. He says, go to the highways and the hedges, those places that are a little bit further off, and invite them into the banquet as well. Bring them in as well. And that's the waitress when you sit down, and you don't know her story, but you can kind of tell she's struggling a little bit, and she just needs a little bit of hope. Invite her in. It's the guy that leans across the gas pump to talk about the gas prices. You have no clue who this is, but that's your highways and hedges. 
those people that are a little bit further off, and bring them in. Now when Jesus, he tells this story, he's talking to the Jews. This is primarily what he's talking about. Is you have hoped in the kingdom of heaven, but you've totally missed it. The dinner table was set. The food was ready. I'm here to tell you that the kingdom is here, and the promised people missed out on the promise. But he's also talking to us. I would dare to say that most of us are not Jews in here. He's talking to us, and he actually talks about us twice within this story. The first role that he talks about us having is that of the guest. And there's some of you in here that you've been invited to the dinner party. You've been invited to the kingdom of God, but you've used excuses to hold you back. So you have a choice. You either choose excuses or attendance. The table is set. It's ready for you. You just need to receive the kingdom of heaven. But the second role, and what I primarily want to spend the rest of my time talking about, is that of the servant. Because once you have accepted the grace of God, once you have placed your faith in Jesus and begin following Him, He no longer uh, just wants you to sit back and relax and just attend, but He wants you to be a part of His kingdom as well. He wants you to be the servant that goes out. And I'm going to give you five things from this passage that are going to help you fulfill your role as a servant in the rest of your time in this part of eternity. So if you're taking notes, I just want you to write these down. The first thing that I want you to write down is go out quickly. Go out quickly. Theologian Carl Henry said, The gospel is only good news if it gets there on time. If it doesn't get there on time, it's not the good news that we had hoped that it would be. We have to have an urgency about us to go out and to bring people into the kingdom of heaven. You know, we see all the time on news, shootings, homicide, suicide. And I just have to think about every time I see that, what if that person had just had the hope of Christ? What if they had had the hope of Christ? How would that have transformed their life? Listen, we have the hope of Christ. And we got to get it out into the world so that people can stop dying and living their eternity in a place called hell. There really is a place called heaven and a place called hell. And every person that you see is going to end up in one of those two places. Why would we hold back the hope that we have. He tells the servant, he says, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. We got to have an urgency about us. This isn't a game. Like y'all get like, church just isn't about us coming and being a part of the body on Sunday morning. It's about us being the body all throughout the week and inviting in the lost and the broken and bringing them into the kingdom of heaven. The table is set. It's ready. But it's on us to go and get them. The next thing that you can write down is there is still room. Look at the pews beside you. There's still room. There's still room to invite people into the feast that God has prepared for them. There's still room. This is what the servants come back and say. The servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. There's still room. You know what happens when you fill up a church building? You just have more services. You know what happens when you can't contain them with the services? You build a bigger building. The whole thing is that Jesus, there's more than plenty of him to go around. There are lost people out in this world that don't know Jesus. that are going to spend their eternity in a place called hell. Now just imagine what would happen. I'd say there's about 50 of us in this room, right? What would happen if 
we just went out and we just invited one person to church over the next year. Like, I'm not saying that you need to be bringing 15 people with you, but like, let's just say that we invested in one person over the next year. You know what happened at the end of the year? There would be a hundred of us in the church building. You know what happened at the end of the, the second year? There would be 200. And then year three, there would be 400. And year four, it would be 800. Year five, it would be 1,600. Year seven, it would be 3,200. Year eight, it would be 6,400. And year uh, nine, it would be, or eight, would be 12,800. Year nine, it would be 25,600. And year 10, guess this, 51,000. And 200 people in the kingdom of God. There's 43,000 people in Davie County. All it takes is 10 years of us just being faithful and bringing one person into the kingdom of God. And then just multiplying it out from there. In 20 years, there will be 54, or, yeah, 52,428,800 people. That's 15% of the U.S. population. In two decades... We would see 15% of the U.S. population. In 23 years, we would have to go to Mexico and to Canada because we'd run out of people to invite to church in the U.S. In 28 years, we'd run out of people in the entire world. In three decades, we could reach every single person on the planet. You know when we stop inviting people? When they're all here. That's when we stop. He's saying there's, there's still room at the table. So how do we do this? Point number three. We compel people. It's on us to compel people to come to the kingdom of heaven. And the master said to the servant... Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. we got to compel them. So how do we compel them? We compel them with our story. Because listen, we've tried debating the Bible with people, and typically that never works. But you know what they can't argue? They can't argue your story. And every single person in here, you have a story of how God has redeemed you and brought you into His grace. And that's what's going to compel people to come into the kingdom of heaven. We can debate the Bible all day long. Listen, I like debating the Bible. I, I have fun with it. But I know that it's going to be my story that actually draws people in. Because when they hear that I'm just a jacked up sinner, just like them, they're going to relate to that. And God, if, if you gave him grace, then you can give me grace too. So we need to compel them to come in. But not just to compel them, but we need to compel them to point number four, come and see. Now this passage, it doesn't actually say come and see. It says to come in. But I'm going to share with you why I say to come and see. Again, it says... And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges to compel people to come in. We want them to come and see. In John chapter 4, we don't have to turn there. Um, I'm just going to summarize the story. You see the woman that's at the well, and this woman, she has a past, right? And Jesus comes up and talks to her, and they begin talking theology and scripture but Jesus lets her have an experience with her. And that experience marks her and changes her. That's her story of how Jesus showed up at the well and changed her life. She goes back to the city and she says, Come, see a man. Come, experience this guy Jesus and see what I've experienced. 
She experienced something so powerful that she knew that she had to go and bring others to come and see and see for themselves. It's not on us to fully convince them that Jesus is Christ. The Holy Spirit is good enough to do that himself. Like he doesn't need you to say every single thing perfectly correctly. He just needs you to bring them to a place, whether it's a church building, it's at your home when you're having dinner with them, it's even in that moment. He just needs you to bring them to a place where they can come and see. And once they experience Jesus, that's what transforms them. So we need to have that type of attitude. Like it's not on me to fully convince them and convert them. I don't have that type of power. But when they experience the Holy Spirit, when they experience Jesus, that's the life-transforming power that they need. So we compel them to come and see, and this is the last thing, that my house may be filled. That my house, talking about God, His house, that His house may be filled. And it's not about numbers. It's not about all of that. It's about lives. He wants everybody to be a part of His kingdom. He wants them all here. And that's exactly what He says, so that my house may be filled. So why don't we do this? Well, typically we have our own excuses. Like why we don't go and and bring people into the kingdom of heaven. First excuse that we have is we're afraid of being rejected. Like what? What if they say no? Well, Jesus said when they tell you no, they're not telling you no, they're telling me no. So you don't worry about their response. You just be faithful with what I've asked you to do. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of like, I mean, what if people knew that I, I love Jesus this much? That's a great problem to have. I think about like in the 90s, I don't know if any of y'all remember DC Talk. We're talking about Jesus Freak. And, and that's how our hearts should be wired is, Jesus, I, I wish that people would say I was a little bit crazy for you. The next excuse that we use is, well, I don't feel like I know enough. Like I, I mean, I didn't go train for this. Well, listen, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are a professional Christian. Like, there's no differentiation between your pastor and you. The same Holy Spirit lives in both of you. And He can use you to invite people in to the kingdom of heaven. You think, well, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. I just gave you how. It's to compel people. Tell them your story. Tell them what God has done in your own life. And how he wants to do that same thing in their lives. Compel them to come and experience Jesus for themselves. So that's just my charge for you. Is that we would be a, a church body. and Not just Rescue House. Not just Hardison. But the entire church body. We would just reach out and bring people in. When I was in college... I had a professor that was teaching me uh, how to preach, and he shared a story. And he said that he was, he was asked to go preach an evangelistic message, like he wanted to see people saved at an old Baptist church, but he had never been there before. They promised him, hey, the, the house will be packed, there will be people all over the place, they want to come and see you preach. And sure enough, he gets there, and there's over 500 people packed into this small, old-school Baptist church. There's standing room only, people out in the foyer. And he just felt led in the moment, just when he began his message, to just start with prayer. And in that prayer, with every head bowed and eyes closed, he just asked him, hey, is there anybody in here that you're just like a little bit skeptical about Jesus? Like you, you're not even sure why you're here. And you just, you don't believe this whole Jesus thing. Not a hand went up in the crowd. So he said, well, I want to ask now, like,
for those who are vibrant followers of Jesus, like, I mean, you know that you know that you have a relationship with Jesus. Every single hand went up in the air. He said that he pushed his notes aside because he was going to preach the gospel. But he was like, y'all don't need to know the gospel. You know it already. You need to hear a message of go out quickly. And that's what he ended up preaching that night. And he gave him a charge much like I'm giving you this morning. I think sometimes we just get so comfortable with us. Just us. That we forget that there are lost, hurting, and broken people outside of these four walls. That God has called us to invite into the kingdom of heaven so that they can experience the joy and hope of Christ that we have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, I just pray blessings over this church. I pray that your hand of favor, like it has already been, would just continue over this congregation. And God, that you would give them a boldness to reach more people for your son, Jesus. Just as these servants went out to the highways and the hedges, God, that you would use them <clears throat> to invite their lost friends, family members, into the kingdom. That you would use them to speak life and truth into a hurting community here in Moxville and beyond, God. And God, we just give you praise, first and foremost, for your son, Jesus, but also for your word that speaks and is living and active today. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Chris, thank you for that very inspiring and meaningful message. If everyone will now please stand and we'll sing our closing hymn, number 337.
to take it to heart and take this opportunity to spread the love of Jesus that we know out to the world. May you all now go in peace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.